What up, y'all? This is a very special first iteration, experimental, weird version of an episode of Secret Skin because uh, usually I'm the one doing the interviewing. But this week and um, probably a few weeks going forward, um, having people interview me, I'm going to what had happened was myself starting this episode talking about my album, Dark Comedy. And I'm fortunate to be joined by a very talented interviewer and writer from Stony Island Audios, Dad Bod, Rap Pod, Mr. David Ma. How you doing today, sir? Good to be here with you, man. Huge fan of the album. So really excited to sort of let people know about the depths of the album and how it came about and just, uh, you know, all the backstories on it. Awesome. I'm glad we got you on an album you like. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's been pretty good for the, uh, for the final product. And before we get into it, I'd love to do a quick sneaky plug for Dad Bod Rap Pod. If you want to just let people know in a quick fashion what you guys do over at that pod that I love so much. The tagline that we always say is that it's, we're three men of a certain age. And we just kind of argue over rap shit. And the show, you know, we're lucky enough to have today's batch of talent as well as, you know, old school luminaries. And it's a chat show. We get to interview them. We get to talk to our heroes. We get to talk to cats who we admire nowadays. And we kind of just, you know, wrap it up into um, a little package every week. I host it with Nate LeBlanc as well as Damone Carter, a.k.a. Dem One. And uh, yeah, man, we're just uh, we're just having fun doing this. I think we're on year five and um, happy to be a part of the Stony Island crew. I'm happy to have y'all. You guys make a show that I fantastically look forward to hearing all the time. With some of, you know, like you said, some of some of people who I call peers, some people who make music that I might not know personally, but I'm very interested in and a lot of real rap heroes. It's great. And I want everybody to check that out. But right now, we're here to talk about my ooh, third, fourth album, I lose count, <laughs> uh, Dark Comedy. So, Mr. Ma, I'm going to have you take it away. Yes, sir. So, a lot of the journalistic stuff I do anyways, um, I do a lot of liner notes. I do a lot of historical stuff for like Wax Poetics and Billboard and stuff. And I'm always curious about just putting everything in context. So, I think that's sort of my intent for this uh, interview here. So, just taking a look at the project and the context and everything. You've had collaborative projects before. On Unapologetic Art Rap was filled with like self-deprecation and it felt personal and had uncomfortable truths. But on this one, on Dark Comedy, all that felt a little bit more amplified, at least to me as a listener. I just want to see, is that a fair assessment? And that was 2014. Like looking back, how do you feel about the album now? I think that is a fair assessment. I listened back to it today for the first time in a long time. I can remember being really excited for people to hear this album because like, I felt like in the course of making it, like I finally figured out how to say some things that I had been trying to say. There was just an energy that I had when I was coming up with song concepts, when I was getting beats from people and just, there was something about my process at that time that became a little bit more refined. And I was just having so much fun fashioning what the concepts of each of these songs would be. And then when I figured out that the title of this project was Dark Comedy, it, it was also going along with me figuring out that dark comedy is kind of the name for what I do. So it was kind of all of that self-actualization going into the song making. I do feel like it's right to say that a lot of the stuff I was doing up until that point was magnified because I think I started to understand what I was doing a little more. And so when I'm going back and listening, there's a part of me that's like very much appreciative of the leap that I felt like I made from the previous album to that one. The one thing that kind of bugs me when I listen to it is that I can hear my journey in recording and I can hear that I was making a lot of like very ambitious recording choices that I didn't necessarily know how to do. So, you know, I appreciate the ambition, but I don't, I don't always appreciate the execution. <laughs> what, were there specific um, moments on the album where you're like, I love the ambition, but not the execution? Yeah, if I look at a song like uh, Death Mate Black or Big Pretty Bridges, those couple of songs at the end, uh, I was doing this kind of choral delivery where like there's like three or four layers of me doing the verses and the hooks. And you keep singing yesterday Cause it's all gonna happen again Brand new once again One year later it's all gonna happen again. Like never before, all over again, one year after. It's all gonna happen again. 
The sessions for those songs had like 50 million vocal tracks of me trying to do all those layers. What I understand now is that if I'm going to do a bunch of layers and they're all going to mostly be me doing the same tone, I don't need that many. I'll get the same effect out of doing one main vocal down the middle and doing two of the same ones on the side if all I'm going to do is the same tone. Now, if I'm going to do some harmonies and add some different notes in there, then I can get as freaky as I want with the track count. But I think I was doing a lot of layering of the exact same tone. And this is a hyper-technical thing, but it's something that gets on my nerves when I go back and listen to that stuff now. Well, you know, when I listen to albums that come off very personal, I'm always curious about where the artist was in their stage in life. And um, recently, we spoke to a great MC, uh, Psalm One, as you did as well. And um, she mentioned that you were homecoming king in uh, high school. I was like, wow, first off, I did not know about you in that life stage. Um, I guess you've always been sort of a gravitational type dude. But it just made me think, what was your life like while you're making this album? I was actually homecoming king in college. In high school, I didn't have the social skills to speak to people I didn't know, let alone campaign for something. So doing it in high school would have been beyond me, but uh, I, I did manage to do that in college. As far as this album, I think I was pretty comfortable in my life as a creator at that time. My son, who I referenced, I think a couple times on the album was like two or three, maybe four while I'm making it. So he's not a baby anymore. He's He requires a little bit less care. I think he started going to preschool around this time. So this is when I really was able to live a day job as a creator. So the entire time when he's at preschool, so let's say I'm dropping him off at eight and picking him up at three or something like that. I now have a work day as an artist for the first time. I think that's another thing that speaks to the difference in process on this album is I really had time. Like I really had time to sit with these songs. I remember, for instance, the song History of Modern Dance. I remember spending a couple entire work days just listening to that beat on repeat like i had the time to let that beat like go inside of me and live there before i ever started having to pick what the hook would be what the chorus would be what the concept is anything i just had the time to spend to sit with that with that beat and and figure out what i want what i wanted that song to be and so yeah i was i was comfortable with my time as an artist i felt like i had a a, a healthy resource of time uh, maybe for the first time. Yeah, my life was pretty stable at the time. And, and so um, I was putting a lot of resources into making music and, and being pleased with the results from day to day. Okay, okay, great, man. I sort of want to go through the album sort of liner note style, sort of breaking down each track and um, just getting some insight on them. And of course, um, it kicks off with Dark Comedy Morning Show. Dark comedy cold is the ocean at a low because nobody seems to know when I'm joking. On that cut, it references Hellfire Club, LA record label, famously founded by No Can Do. And I believe your second album, uh, Rappers Will Die of Natural Causes, was off of that. Can you reflect on Hellfire Club's impact and how was it leaving? So the Hellfire Club is a very complicated topic. I would say it's complicated just because it's a little bit fraught emotionally. Hellfire Club was a magical time in my life as my life intersects with music and indie rap. You know, it was started as a record label. You know, No Can Do started it to kind of fill a void because at that time, he's putting out records through Alpha Pup. A lot of the smaller indie labels that had been around LA, that had been the powerhouses of the LA underground for years, by that point had shut down. Labels like Cornerstone and Mush and Basement, all these record labels that had been putting out all the underground stuff were gone. There was a big boom in like the beat scene stuff happening around like Low End Theory. So those cats were getting on and doing things and there was energy around that. But like there was not a lot of people catering to rap music and No Can knew all the rappers and he was around Alpha Pup and started to learn the business. So he was like, okay, I'll start a label and put on the homies that I think are talented. It served as, as, a, as an important platform 
especially in my generation of Project Blowed, because that's how I knew No Can, and, and that was kind of like the central headquarters of our network. So he starts that. So now, us as LA underground rappers of our generation, we have this outlet. He's putting out records. He ends up linking with Bus Driver in like subtitles. So this is like the generation a little bit older than us at Project Blow. And Bus Driver is like one of the more successful ones, one of our more successful OGs out of the camp. So like him messing with No Can kind of like really validated the label in a way. Because, you know, Bus Driver had a lot of energy in his career, too, like messing with like Big Dada and, and uh, Anti and the labels he was messing with that were like, had a little bit of a bigger scope than, you know, a lot of the LA Underground stuff at the time. So Bus Driver coming into the fold was a big deal. It kind of added a lot of weight and cachet to what we were doing. And we started touring a lot because Driver toured a lot, you know, and him messing with us as a label, he would bring us on tour with him. So me and No Can and Driver started doing a lot of road stuff together. And in that time, Milo started coming up, you know, known as R.A.P. Ferreira these days. You know, I started making music with him. Uh, he started putting out music through Hellfire Club and making music with Driver as well. And then we all started making stuff together. Driver, me, No Can, Milo, Verbs, Rhetoric, Kale. So now we got this kind of collective going. We made the Dorna versus Tuki album. Like, you know, we call it a mixtape, but it was basically an album that I thought was, was fucking awesome. So you got, you know, we got music coming out, presenting this kind of new unified force, and we're on the road. But on the road, a lot of times it started to be Driver, No Can, Me, and Milo. And in a sense, I think people started to look at Hellfire Club as just us four people. And that started to take on this kind of energy of its own because I think around that time you had stuff like, um, so you had Black Hippie, you had like Brock Hampton. So like there's this little bit of energy of like Hellfire Club being this group that's us four. And writers writing about that, people singing us that way, us having opportunities as just the four of us to be Hellfire Club. But that was kind of antithetical to how No Can started the thing. He started it as a record label. So now it's kind of getting confusing because it's becoming something different than what he intended. And he was always the leader of Hellfire Club. It was his thing. It was his company. So I think ultimately what ended up happening, the opportunities and the, the, the career growth that was available to us as a foursome being separate from the original intention of the label, kind of it, it started creating this tension. Ultimately, it was impossible to keep doing business through that tension. And, you know, for people paying attention, they saw certain things blow up on the internet, saw certain shots fired back and forth, and um, ultimately things fell apart. I think it's all love between everybody now, but it's it's difficult for me to think about because I think we had such a huge opportunity to make an impact in indie rap and beyond with the opportunities that we had in that moment. It's hard for me not to regret that we weren't in a better place to be able to take advantage of all that because those opportunities don't come very often. One of my clearest memories of this album is being on tour with the four of them. And I was playing this album for them and just kind of talking about all that I wanted to come from it and, and them kind of taking it in. Like we all we did was play music for each other on tour. And I just remember how pleased they were listening to it and the feedback they were giving me about it and how excited we all were for it to come out. And yeah, so, you know, this album has a lot of uh, very close associations emotionally with me and Hellfire. Perfect, man. Thank you. The next cut is Qualifiers. I see the deepest screams. I hear the darkest blues. Might not be synesthesia. Might be your apartment fumes. Could, could get up and dance. Could, could I wanted to sort of get some inside baseball when it comes to you singing on a track. Is it always immediately deliberate or do you just catch the beat and decide to sing or do you go into it saying, yo, I want to break up some of the raps with some singing or what's your approach to that? I mean, to me, it's very beat by beat. It's very song by song and how and how that happens. There have been times where I've gone into a thing expecting to do something melodic and ended up throwing the melody away. There's been things that I've written to be delivered completely without melody that in the course of recording, I end up finding a melody and leaning more into that. This was one of my first times trying to write a song with that sort of like trap cadence and the way that that kind of had me hitting the beat like it just felt really natural to add a melody to it and you know the beat was melodic i thought you know uh, the hook that came to me was very melodic so it seemed only right to add a lot of melody to the uh to the verses 
clearly ambitious, but I didn't all the way know what I was doing technique wise. I think I did okay, but you know, it's certainly a song that if I had written it now, I'd have a better idea of how to do a more perfect version of that delivery. Okay, okay. In this song, you mentioned playing words with friends. Hold up, it's my turn again. I'm playing 13 games of words with friends. Lift your hands, lift your head. It's one of the apps that I actually was addicted to uh, at one point. And, and it just made me think, like, in general, how true are your songs? Like, besides obvious ones and perhaps are just works of fiction, but typically, how, how, how truthful are they when you mention stuff? Half of it is like very real because I try, like one of the things I'm always trying to find is like, what about my life is absurd enough to encapsulate and comment on? And like legit at that time, like I probably did have like 13 games ongoing and words with friends. Like it was a big deal in my life. And, you know, once I kind of realized, oh, not everybody's playing 13 games. Then I was like, oh, that's a bar that one's pretty real. Uh, you know, wiping my son's ass and getting shit on my hands was pretty real. <laughs> I am also capable of pushing things to absurdity at any given time, but it's usually, it's 50-50. Well, um, just moving forward to Thirsty Ego Raps, uh, this question actually pertains to um, another uh, Patreon question. The beginning of the song uh, mentions um, David Gahan, uh, which is a reference to um, the singer from Depeche Mode. My man Dave Gahan is in Depeche Mode. Used to have a crush on Miss L.A. from Death Row. This business is popular. And the song ends with you mentioning the words he can spell, which is, you know, also Depeche Mode. I believe their first album. I have the tiger if he sees gazelle. Popular rap tropes are chose via speak and spell. See, uh, this question was really funny for me from the Patreon, because honestly, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that they had written anything to do with speaking spells. That was just a random bar. That's just too coincidental of a tie-in, though. I mean, even when I was looking it up, I was like, wow. I don't think that hard about anything in life. Certainly to the point where I wouldn't have put it at the beginning of the song. and at the, I'm not that smart. I'm just not that smart. That's pretty crazy, though. Yeah, that's, that's wild. I learned that, too, today. <laughs> <laughs> just I want to touch on the song just real quick again. I mean, I love the, the line about Lord Bravery. My nickname. Lord Bravery, my voice memos that I tape record lazily. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that song and just, you know, how it came about and the intentions behind that one. I mean, so shout out to Illingsworth on that beat. You know, I think in terms of the sound of this album, a lot of the production that I had been doing up until this point had been LA beat scene kind of centric and Project Blow producer centric. But linking up with Illingsworth and adding that little bit of Detroit to it, you know, that little bit of like soul and funk with the beat scene, swingy stuff. I really feel like that kind of set off that next phase of my output. When I heard that beat, it was just like, yeah, I just want to rap. I just want to like just rhyme hard, just rhyme crazy things on this beat. And here's a funny little tidbit about that song. That song originally had three verses. And whenever I did it live at that time, I would do the, the extra verse. And the song used to start with that verse. But when I cut the song into its final version, I cut the, the entire like first minute off of the song. So the song is kind of starting in the middle now. But there's a there's an extra verse. And, uh, you know, people on my Patreon, <laughs> they already got it. Oh, nice. OK. The next one is Golden Age Raps. Hi. Yeah. Fuck red in California, cause shit's pretty racial there. I'm envious of anyone with full grown facial hair. Yeah. I'm always in between hair. Some of the rhymes on that, like racial there, but facial hair. I think you rhyme telecast with blue-eyed Ellen Mask. Um, I read I read this article with um, Opio from Souls of Mischief where he was talking about setting up the punchlines and how sometimes they're not sometimes they're too obvious. And I'm not saying that the punchlines on here are too obvious. If anything, I think they're just mad creative and i'm just wondering what was the writing process for this one like this song was like literally stream of consciousness and i think i didn't really know what i was writing until i said it's the, the golden, golden age. age tell the internet how you got fucked over and buy a minivan with 17 cup holders and then that kind of informed the rest of it and so like it ended up being this sort of meditation on this thought that we are in the best of times, but also like to define that by all the little weird shit that was just like right now. Like, like 
it was like a best of time sort of premise that ended in like pointing out all the little existential weirdness of right now. And, and of course, by right now, I mean 2013. And so like, I don't remember, like I saw an Ellen mask somewhere, you know? So then like, I, like I wanted to rhyme Ellen mask and telecast and, you know, and, yeah, fuck Red in California because shit's pretty racial there. Like two years before that, I had a horrible experience in Red in California that it was very racist. And so like that was just me kind of getting that off. But like, again, I didn't even know what the song was at that point. I just started writing and that was like the first thing that came out. But yeah, that song's very stream of consciousness. I love, you know, I, I hate the word multis, but that is kind of the language that I write in, that I rap in. So I'm always just trying to find like the wildest unexpected syllables to rhyme with. And um, yeah, I was definitely playing with a lot of that in that song. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, you mentioned st stream of consciousness and and you obviously have had um, a history with uh, freestyling. When it comes to writing a song, I mean, how much of it is like you're sitting there on a notebook or in a, on a notepad and how much is it is sort of freestyling and then you know, maybe cobbling it together later. On the um, Kavanaugh album I made with Serengeti, the first one, there's a song on there called Overland, and my entire verse on that is freestyle. So demanding, underhanded, underpinnings, got a hundred winnings and many losses. I be flossing my teeth, I got no beat, I am a Christmas wreath. I miss the days. I'm but aside from that, I can't remember another time where I ever, like, freestyled in the booth like i'll freestyle like ad libs or like little talking at the beginning and the end of a song but usually when it comes to albums that i'm writing and making and, and putting out it's always written okay so moving on very much money ice king dream love that cut Ryan on the floor of a chinese restaurant crown on my hip like simon petrikoff thought of a song called thinking the master plans the production on this album is noticeably different from your previous projects and was that intentional or so, is or was that something that just happened organically? Because, I mean, you you have DiBiase on here, Kenny Siegel, you mentioned Ellingsworth. Talk a little bit about that, the production on this one. I won't say it's intentional, but I think my albums are always a little bit of an intersection between me and my current network at the time. My first two albums were all like Beat Scene LA and Project Blow producers because that's who I knew. So that was who I was getting beats from. I think around this time, because I, you know, I started touring a lot more, doing a lot more collabs. So I started meeting different producers from like all over the place. And yeah, I just I, I think I just expanded the scope of who I was getting beats from and who I was meeting and who I was working with. And I think that's what you end up hearing. It wasn't too much of an aim in any direction. It was more just like increasing the pool of beat intake and, and uh, being open to collaborating with different people than I had before. When I listen to the production on here, I mean, it's not like y'all sampled the Beatles or anything, but what considerations do you need to take into account when it comes to beats and sample clearances and stuff? I got to say, for the most part, before I started putting out my records myself, I used to not really be concerned with it that much because typically my stuff has flown under the radar for that kind of thing. Where like, it's not doing the kind of numbers where like a bunch of litigators are coming around trying to figure out what's what. And like you said, we try to avoid stuff that samples obvious things. Like, you know, it, it, and honestly, when it's too obvious, it makes the beat sound kind of whack to begin with because it doesn't sound like very creative. It sounds kind of like too easy. One thing that I think has always been something that set the beat scene apart in LA was, you know, there's a lot, there's been a lot of electronic sounds in a lot of those beat scene beats. And because there's a lot of sound in it, that means a lot of them don't have samples, which always made, you know, people from that scene or, or, or producers from that scene a lot easier to work with legally. I think around that time, too, also the industry was shifting a little bit. And I think that labels were getting a little bit more concerned about samples. And I'm not sure if that meant that they were being any more proactive in clearing things, but I think it made them more aware and more like cautious about trying to avoid stuff that was obvious, even if it wasn't like pop music obvious. I think that's just where things were headed. And I think because of that, producers were more mindful and me as a, as a person picking beats was always mindful of. Doug Stanford, next cut with uh, Hannibal Burst. But don't bootleg my comedy, pay the fee. Bye. Tell your cousin, stay the fuck from off the world stop. And don't buy a Honda Civic, that's a girl's car. And don't buy a Chevy Aveo or a Mini Cooper or 
Yaris. I have a little Hannibal Burris story. I um, I actually interviewed him for uh, I think it was Red Bull Music Academy, and I had him name his like top five rap records he couldn't live without. We did it. It was all good. His list was great. We posted it, and he was like, "Take that shit down, man. I don't I don't want that shit up. Take that down." And I was like, "Okay." And it's not like him and I are friends or anything, but you guys are friends. I don't know. I don't know if I tell people what rap music he likes, maybe we won't be friends no more. I don't know. For whatever reason, he wanted it to be taken down, but it just kind of led me to think about your guys' relationship when it comes to rap music. I mean, obviously, he has a nuanced taste when it comes to it, and. You know, how how did y'all meet and how is your relationship when it comes to music? Oh, so we met in college. We went to college together. Uh, I was actually his RA for a little while in undergrad. I was around when he first started doing comedy in college and, and watched his career develop. And it's been, it's been awesome. And um, we've always stayed cool, always worked together. His relationship with music is really interesting because he listens... Like he's a big fan of music. He's a bigger fan of music than I am, to be honest. He listens to a lot more rap than I do. Like he's very often putting me on the stuff that I haven't heard. But I think it's part of that thing where, like, since I've been in this business, like I- I've definitely killed some of the joy in music for me by being in the music business. Like definitely, I've definitely like stomped on some of my own enjoyment of rap music by making rap music for a living. You know, and, and of course he's making music now, but he's had this, you know, this successful career on the other side of entertainment. So I think he's been able to maintain the same love of music that I used to have when I was young. Like his has developed and maintained further. So yeah, he's always he's always listening to music. He's a pretty good DJ too. Like he's he's a D, he's so good of a DJ, it's kind of annoying. I'm just like, dude, how are you good at all of these things? Like, stop. Man, it's not fair, man. Okay, so that, that's your guys' musical relationship. What about, like, I mean, do you guys have, like, a comedy relationship? Because, I mean, obviously, you, you're a comedian as well. And I just always kind of wondered that. Like, what are the connections? And how is it when, when you guys hang out? Like, are you dissecting jokes as well as the production on the Ghostface album? <laughs> you know, that's interesting. We, we typically, like, me and him really connect on, like, a human level. Like, we tend to be more talking about what's going on in each other's lives than, like biz stuff or this is the thing it might be like actual business business type conversations with like managers and agents and like that sort of thing more than it would be dissecting music i'd feel really embarrassed to be engaged with a conversation with him about like comedy analysis (laughs) because i'm armchair at best when it comes to that like i'm adjacent i'm not like actually in that field doing them things and i've heard a lot more stand-up than i've done so i don't feel fit to really speak on that stuff a lot of the time but um you know most of the time you know i I think that the stuff that we talk about is like it's real human check-in shit and it's like business analysis shit more than it is like creative analysis you touched on comedy a little bit um the next cut is john lovitz Come on. Yeah. Come on. Uh, uh. How did you get into comedy? I mean, to begin with, and I'd like to sort of transition that question to the new Negro show that you had with Baron Vaughn as well, just to give people a little bit of background on that. So the first time I performed in front of a comedy audience was at the Upright Citizens Brigade here in L.A. They do a show called Ass Cat every Sunday. And it's like where they have a lot of their like super Jedi improvisers, like the, 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 just the masters link up. And the way that they do the show is that they have somebody either from the audience or they have some an invited guest tell stories. And then they listen to the story. They ask a couple of questions and they'll just start doing super high level improv just based on something that came out of the stories. Sometimes when they do invited guests, they're musicians. So I was invited as a musician. I came and I did a couple songs. They asked me a couple questions about them. And then they did amazing improv based on the songs and a little bit of the context behind them. But that was the first time I performed in front of a comedy audience. And the way that like they were actually listening was like electrifying for me. It was like nothing I'd experienced before because I'd always just performed in front of rappers, mostly rappers or fans of other rappers that I was opening for. And people would be vibing or, you know, and people might be paying attention or might be giving energy, but they weren't really like listening to how I was constructing things. Because I always put a lot of thought and care and detail into how I was constructing bars and... When I performed in front of that crowd at UCB, like 
when I said the parts that I thought were funny, they'd be laughing because they were listening, like in the song. And I was like, okay, I need to be in front of this audience as much as possible because they like they understand what I'm doing and they're reacting in the ways that I've always dreamed of like a crowd reacting. So I did that and it was just mind blowing for me. And then uh, I, I was able to do it again. And the second time I did it, I got, I made sure it got videoed so I could show other comics whose shows that I might've wanted to do. Uh, I showed them me performing this environment, show how it works. And I was able to get on a lot of shows that way. For one of the first people I harassed was Paul F. Tompkins. And he was doing uh, a bunch of variety shows at the Largo then. And he took the time out of his day to watch one of the videos I sent him. And he invited me to come to a show. And that opened me up. Like between doing those shows at UCB and doing those variety shows with him, it just really opened up the doors to me to do a lot of different stuff around town. That ultimately led to this one day I was doing this thing called a comedy rap battle, uh, which is where a bunch of stand-ups that aren't afraid to rap get together and battle each other. It sounds like it would be terrible, but it's often like very entertaining. I would do these events and lose horribly because like it, I'm I'm coming into it with my street battling mindset and nobody wants that <laughs> in these environments. Like, <laughs> people uh, do not want to hear me tear somebody apart. That's not what they're there for. But at one of these, I battled a guy and lost and he was doing this cool like old man character, but he was just like barn out as this old man. And he was just, he had everybody on the floor laughing. He ended up winning the whole battle and that guy turned out to be Baron Vaughn. And afterwards me and Baron talked, uh, exchanged numbers. I think I gave him uh, my my album at the time, which was uh, Rappers of Die Natural Causes. He rolled around listening to it and he called me up and I, I went and did his podcast and I had him do my podcast. And we just talked and talked and talked and found out we had a lot in common. And he was doing this show called The New Negroes as part of this comedy festival that was in Portland at the time. And um, either the second or third time he did it, he had me come do it with him integrated uh, where he'd be hosting and doing stand up. And I'd perform and play music for the guests coming on and off of the stage. We did that and it worked out great. Uh, that's honestly the first time I did that is where I first met Jack Knight, who just passed away. Uh, rest in peace to Jack Knight, where I met people like Sam J and Janelle James and um, just a, a dream list of all the incredible black talent in stand up. And, um, and then we just started doing the show like that you know, doing it at festivals all around the country and doing it locally here in LA. And ultimately it got developed into a television show with Funny or Die that we ended up selling to Comedy Central. And we did a season of it and we made some amazing music with it too, because each episode had an original song. So we had Lizzo, Method Man, MF Doom, Fonte, Samus, uh, Father. Yeah, we did that. We did what we thought was an amazing show but it was on Friday at 10 o'clock at night when couldn't nobody watch it. Um, and it, it, they didn't have no streaming thing at the time. So uh ended up getting canceled. And and that was the story of the New Negroes. I mean, you know, we're still, we still exist. We just don't exist on television anymore. <laughs> I do the rap stuff, Baron's a stand-up. But don't try to brand us or put us in handcuffs for fans up. Jolton got some music too. It feels new, but it's not confusing, new Negro. Some people are scared of a word of a... Are you able to watch those episodes anywhere online? Yeah, they're on Paramount+. Plus. They're on the streaming service that nobody has. <laughs> you mentioned all those artists, you know, Lizzo, Method Man, Fonte, um, all incredible, but I want to fixate on a favorite of ours, which is, of course, MF Doom. Black has no standing at law. Black Billy come back to the jaw. They got the dogs and the cats at your door. If you're smart, get your ass on the floor. Yeah, villain within reason. No consumption is pig grilling season. Treason, black, white, Indonesian. Talk a little bit about that process and, and the and the track you guys came up with and how everything went down. I did a verse on the Czar Face meets Metal Face album. It's a track called Phantoms. Slipping one too many times, may not be no coming back. Coming back, coming back. Never let it happen. Lose your phone, tell side chick, get the packet. Other fan, will write it all down and get the rap. I fought a ghost in my apartment. He had too many hit points. He bested me and told me I should have invested in Bitcoin. And then he lit joints and offered me a fancy. So I kind of had a foot in the door already and kind of knew who to talk to when it came to getting Doom on a track. You know, when we got presented with our budget for getting talent on New Negroes, it wasn't a ton of money we had at our disposal, but between the little money we were able to offer and like the kind of, you know, exposure we could offer being on a major 
cable outlet, people were willing to mess with us. My homie Ned Arb did that beat. Each one of our songs coincided with the theme of an episode we did. So that whole entire episode was about like how like as a black man, you kind of have to have this double consciousness of like, you have to be aware of yourself, but because people get killed by police or people get uh, the police called on them for looking suspicious just by existing, you kind of have to be aware of how other people see you as well. It was actually uh, Rhymefest helped kind of fashion us the, the the concept of this song too, but we took that concept to this place called Police Myself. Like we all have this tiny little policeman in our heads that kind of lets us know when we're doing things that might put us in danger. And so we came up with the concept of the song. I wrote my part. We sent it off to Doom, and he was with it, and he did his part. And you know, he still obviously wasn't. He wasn't able to be in the video because he wasn't able to be in the country. We did the song together, and that was pretty much that. You know, rest in peace to my favorite MC of all time, MF Doom. Thank you, man. Thank you for explaining that. At this point, we're probably around the midpoint of the album, and it made me think about the sequencing of the album, especially your later albums, which I love how everything's sequenced, but how much thought do you put into the sequencing of your albums? You know, I don't put a lot of thought into it, but I put a lot of feeling into it, if that makes sense. I iterate a lot on track listing, and that's with every one of my albums. I spend a lot of time listening to the album over and over and over again and tweaking the track list over and over and over and over and over again till I get what feels like energetically the statement that I'm trying to make. I tend to want to put harder hitting things up front. I tend to want to put more experimental, more ambiguous messages later, more contemplative stuff. But it's just all about how it feels to me. It's all about whether and like, like, you know, each album to me feels like a sentence. And so I'm always just trying to make sure that it's reading correctly and communicating what I'm trying to communicate. And I do so much iteration. The next track is Idaho, which actually kind of has a special meaning to us because we were on a plane with uh, you, uh, Video Dave, and Armin Hammer to uh, Boise, Idaho for the Tree Fort Music Festival. That's what I thought about when I saw the uh, song title, but it seems like a very revealing track. Maybe we should have stayed where we was. We hopped in thinking it was a game, and it was. We made it then celebrated post game with the buzz. My hindsight's blurred. Talk a little bit about the song, and is this song about a specific person? Ooh. So, the song exists on a lot of levels, but the real key to understanding this song, there's two of them. One, so my favorite bands, They Might Be Giants, and that's John Flansburg and John Linnell. And John Linnell has a solo album called State Songs, and in State Songs, he has a song called Idaho that is about this story that John Lennon told once about being high on acid, and hallucinating that he was driving his house to Idaho. So John Lennon's story informed John Linnell's song, Idaho, which if you ever listen to that, the music in it sounds very similar, uh, like the, the colors in it sound very similar to the Idaho that I made. Night long, vigil by the picture And then another thing to understand, and this is where it'll get real weird, this album used to have a storyline to it at one point. And in the story of this album, it was going to be that I was doing a show somewhere. And after the show, like, and we were all high and drunk after the show, and we were crashing in somebody's house after that. And we were all high and drunk at the house, but then the person throwing the show who, who was housing us decided to make it into a house party that we didn't want to be at so we just said fuck it we'll start driving to the next town but we're like driving fucked up on the interstate and that's kind of the story of the song but then like in the story that the album was at that time the next thing was that we would have crashed and then that started this whole other thing and that's another thing on my patreon i've, I've put a couple of those songs out because like there's there's like three or four songs around idaho that would have made that story make sense but i ended up pulling all of those off the album and just leaving idaho on there. the next cut is sad face penance raps love the title yeah i know i get it Shout to the Jesus, is nail me to the couch, say ouch for the heatiness. Alcohol in the cuts, have to let it burn. I watch bad movies, cause that's what I deserve. Thumbtack in my shoe, really. You have that line about like, you watch bad movies because that's what I deserve. And 
Um, you also mentioned like tattoos. Keep getting tattoos of old black riddles cause nobody knows. This is sort of a cliche question though, but I mean, how many tattoos do you have? I have like six, but two of them are like cover ups too. So it's like six, but it was like eight total tattoo times. I got my first tattoo at 17. So yeah, the first two I got were like dumb, dumb, super dumb. So like those are like the two on my shoulders that I've since gotten like, you know, I've made I've made presentable. But at the time, they were just dumb young person mistakes. It does seem like an emotional song that isn't completely linear, if that makes sense. The next cut is History of Modern Dance. And I think it's funny because it might be like the most undanceable song on the album. First step is intention, second step is a glance, then a vine intervention, mix of science religion, pretending like we giants, promise I Since, you know, Drake and Beyonce and sort of in that light of, of danceable um, records, will we ever see like a open mic ego rapping over some dark techno type shit? Hey, I've, I've snuck some dance songs out there, man. I think people just try to forget them. I have a song called dance bill on my album animal hospital that song very well might be a mistake but i like it and it's dancey you know i'm not afraid to go there i'm talking about like a full like straight up 12 tracks of, of you rapping over some techno or some house oh an album oh god no god no absolutely not Let's move forward to uh, Death Meet Black. The rejected stone is now the cornerstone. It's in the sky and chemtrails from a door a drone. There's a war between fans. I think it has a lot to do with image and it sounds so confessional. I think in some ways it, it can come off sort of unnerving, like in a good way, in a very deliberate way. And I just kind of wanted to know your mind state going into that. You know, that was tough. That was tough. I was listening to that one today. And there was very clearly some messages that were on my heart. Like the thing about like people being afraid of, of mason jars, but there's worse shit on your, on your identification, identification card. card. For any man to say another man's irrelevant as an ant, trying to grow a trunk and dance like an elephant. So Mr. Frankenstein, dead Joe experiment. Body so there's something really central to that. Like this idea, and, and I, I use mason jars to refer to like, masonry masonic like illuminati shit because i just i think i was around a lot of people who were very scared of all that stuff but in a way where they hadn't actually done any research about any of it and like you know people were being afraid of like buzzwords but you know like there's all sorts of weird symbols on the dollar weird symbols on people's state flags like this shit is all around us and we participate in it constantly so we don't necessarily have to be afraid of like a shadowy cabal when it comes to like dark magic symbols, because like we hold those every day, like we use those every day. There was something about wanting to like shatter some of those notions. When I was listening to it, there didn't seem to be a unified message to it. And if it is, then it eludes me now, but that's kind of always the problem. I can't exactly remember what I was thinking and feeling. It wasn't anything that doesn't feel true to me now, but it doesn't feel like something that's very clear to me now. That makes sense. That song, I think, on this album is a moment of exhale. It's so striking. So that's why I kind of wanted to fixate on that a little bit. Moving forward, um, information featuring Cool AD. Might be my favorite cut off the album. I get Cool Keith vibes off of it. I just wanted to see, like, do you insist on full creative control when it comes to your albums? Or, you know, since it's for a label or since you're collaborating, you deal with it differently? Because I really liked how this one turned turned out, and it, it comes off a little bit different, though. I've had the same phone number for a decade, and various phone models strapped next to my left leg. My first power up was a flip phone. So I have so much creative control that it gets on my nerves sometimes. Like sometimes, like I want somebody else to say something, so I don't feel like it's all on me. Like that's that's one thing that being indie, like. You don't get a lot of that. You don't get a lot of feedback. You don't get a lot of people weighing in. And that's part of what attracts me to doing music this way is because I'm, I'm not a great collaborator. I'm not great at like sharing visions. Like I have my vision and I really like to be in charge of how my own music sounds. So this indie thing works very well. But, you know, the pro is that 
pure vision, right? The con is that every mistake falls back on me like every success does. You know, like it's kind of all my fault either way, which can be a lot of pressure. But yeah, I, I have I, I tend to have complete creative control. I tend to shy away from making records with one producer just because I feel a little bit limited creatively when I do that. Even though, I mean, I've I've had some some the great fortune to, you know, make a record with Awkward, make a record with uh, Paul White. Like, these are amazing producers. I think when it comes to making an album, I like to be able to draw, use more than one palette to paint with. So sometimes that can feel limiting to me. But even then, like, I, I, tend, I tend to be almost a tyrant. <laughs> well, so, I mean, having full creative control, is it more freeing or is it more a little bit constricting? I think it's complete freedom. The one thing that I don't ever dictate to anybody, you know, using this song as an example, I never tell anybody to change their rap or rap how I'm rapping. Or, you know, if I'm doing a song with somebody, like, I'll tell them the premise, uh, show them the song, whatever they want to do with it. That's what they chose to do with it. I really am a proponent of rapper freedom. There's probably certain words I wouldn't abide by because I wouldn't want to have my name behind them, like, you know, slurs and shit like that. Or, But in terms of people taking their own rhyme in whatever direction they want. Like I, I very much fuck with that. And I think Kool Aid did that here and I like I like how he did that. Like he was sort of referencing because I was super dialed into the concept. So I think he created a lot of balance in the song by like referencing the concept but kind of doing his own thing on the beat. What's a computer man? Computer, computer. I don't even know what that is. Computer, computer. I don't even watch TV. What's catfish? Computer, computer. Don't know much about science. Also, I mean, as we sort of round off the album, Big Pretty Bridges, great way to bookend the whole album. To me, and I don't mean this in a bad way, it comes out very emo. Sure. Wrote this song in the hotel room on the day the show got canceled. Now this room feels like Bellevue. Jupiter's got 12. And I spoke to a slug from Atmosphere who he told me at first he, he didn't really like the term emo rap, but then he was like, then I just fully embraced it. It kind of is what it is. And to me, or to this song, it's art rap and it's sort of emo rap. And I just wanted to know, like, you as a modern artist, how do you want to be defined? Or how do you define yourself? I mean, if you look at my first album, it's unapologetic art rap, right? I don't usually call my stuff art rap now, though. And I think part of my journey as a creator is to constantly try to find what the best way to define myself is. I feel like my definition changes all the time and it doesn't help that my intentions change from song to song a lot as well. I embrace the freedom that indie rap provides me to make a bunch of different kinds of rap songs. Because of that freedom, you know, it's kind of hard to find a definition. And I'm not anti-definition because I think definitions help. I think, you know, even if it's just for consumers, right? Like, I think having a label on the bin at the record store that sounds like what you do is helpful. Having a playlist on Spotify or Apple that sounds like what you do, I think that's a helpful thing to have. But I understand that my choices have led me to a place where that's hard to do. And I think a lot of my peers that make interesting music, like I think the same holds true for them. And I think we're all often looking for the proper term to define what it is. But I don't know. And I'm always looking. I've always wondered that, you know, especially for with an artist with a wide palette like yourself, you know, it's easy to say he's an art rapper, especially since you named one of your albums that, you know. So as we uh, close here, Dark Comedy came out in 2014. Um, it's a real interesting year, right? You had Vince Staples had his breakout EP. The Nehruvian Doom album was pretty cool. The Mac Miller album, the Freddie Gibbs Mad Lib cut. I mean, Run the Jewels, just a lot of cool stuff going on. And we were able to talk a little bit about the key to understanding some of these tracks, your creative approach. But looking back on the album now, what do you think is the main engine that drives it? I think the main engine that drove it for me was the joy of being comfortable defining myself as funny, like embracing that part of my writing, embracing the overlap between my approach as a writer and like the way that a stand up comic writes jokes like finding that oh and this is this is you know part of the result of this is doing a lot of those comedy shows and and understanding why my music worked in those environments was because oftentimes my approach is observational the same way a stand-up comics approach is observational like i'm looking around 
at life and processing life in a very similar fashion, trying to point out the absurd things in order to make the points I'm trying to make, pointing out the absurd things that happen in my own mind as a way to kind of paint pictures of things. And I think what really propelled this project to me in terms of creating it was being so excited to find this this way of thinking about myself that felt like it fit and wanting to just make song after song after song after song in that worldview. That's what propelled it for me. I think it's just the joy of finding a very temporary definition for myself. All right, man. Well, perfect. Thanks for humoring my questions about all these dope songs that make up an incredible album. And it's always a good time catching up with you. Likewise, and thanks for uh, taking the time to listen to it and construct such great questions as you and your cohorts do over on the Dad Bod Rap Pod. Speaking of which, is there anything you want to let people know to look out for in terms of the pod or even your own career outside of that? I have some liner notes coming out for uh, Vitamin Me Please. It's the liner notes for um, the coup's uh, Genocide of Juice, which I'm really stoked on. Just completed the liner notes for um, Farside's Lab Cab in California, which also is a fucking favorite. So I actually was in- able to interview Gary Newman. So I'm very stoked on that. I had him break down the pleasure principle, which is, you know, the album where Cars is off of. And I usually do rap shit and I love that album and I've been working on, on the Gary Newman piece for a while. So that's going to come out pretty soon as well. Other than that, the podcast is uh, chugging along and uh, we have a lot of dope guests lined up. And I just think the production value on it is getting better. Shout out to Nate LeBlanc. And now Damone is handling the production too. Thanks so much, Dave. And um, of course, I'll be talking to y'all soon. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for watching that. And if you dug that, leave a thumbs up and say what up in the comments. And make sure to subscribe to Stony Island Audio Audio. for more.